Welcome, everybody, to the Patty G Show. I'm your host, Patty G, here with Seth Dawson from Paperless. We're going to talk all about accounting. Very, very exciting. Oh, awesome. Yeah. We're going to talk about getting <laughs> businesses started, climbing the ladder, and knowing when to leap off and build your own ladder. And also just all things Baton Rouge and growing the brand locally. I'm excited yep. to talk about that. But before we get started, thank you to our sponsors, Triton Stone Group. Uh, stay tuned to the end and hear a little bit more about them. Well, without further ado, Seth, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad we're able to make this work. And big, big thanks and big shout out to Chad for putting all this together. Absolutely. Yeah, Chad's my man. That's yeah. <laughs> I, I heard, I learned before the show, he's, he's your go-to guy. He so, is. <laughs> What is Paperless? So we're a software development firm. Uh, we specialize in document management software, or really just any type of uh, software to make you go paperless. So if it involves any sort of uh, document routing or needing forms or just managing your, your documents, so uh, we've got software programs that actually take care of that for you. Okay, so kind of like a database for businesses. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, sort of. Anything okay. to do with paper. So, gotcha. You know, back in the day, if uh, you had paper lying around, and especially in filing cabinets, we want to get rid of that. Right. And uh, you know, store it electronically, route it electronically. Um, a lot of people think that it's just automatic nowadays because they expect everything to be electronic. But typically, people are printing it out and put it on somebody's desk or trying to ride around a certain way. Yeah. We try and get it out of the paper and do it electronically. So. Yeah. That's people have asked me, Oh, do you want this paper or digital? I'm like, please send me digital. Absolutely. I was like, if you send yeah. it to me on paper, you're going to become my least favorite person. Right. Like, I just, I don't, <laughs> I don't like paper on my desk. I don't like paper and anything, but they still require it for a lot. So they do. It's still inevitable with a lot of people. They still want to print it out a lot of times. Everybody wants to have that feel of that paper. And I want that tangible paper. Yeah, exactly. I don't get it. I'm the same way. I, uh, that, that, <laughs> <laughs> I own a paperless company. I, I, I shred more paper than anybody. So, uh, you know. It's the goal of getting a paperless and you still like print it out. Uh, old school. So, hey, I'm the only guy that show up to a business meeting and I have a notebook and everybody else uh, breaks out their laptops. So laptops, <laughs> tablets, type yeah, it away. Exactly. <laughs> so how did, how did we get here? I did a did a little deep dive on you before we got started mm -hmm. and learned that you've worked your way all the way up from a measly old little uh, staff accountant. Measly. Yeah. And, well, I mean, <laughs> as a staff accountant, it's we're measly. We're the like the yeah. bottom where there's an intern, then us. Like yes, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> that's the progression. <laughs> so you started out um, as that and you kind of worked your way up to owning your own company for many years. So what was that kind of progress? Well, I guess that, uh, you know, my interest in all of everything that got me here is kind of started when I was in college. Um, I worked uh, two different jobs, but uh, I worked at uh, the Coca-Cola bottler, the local Coca-Cola bottler. And um, we were college students working in the accounting department after hours. And uh, they needed someone to kind of work on their their mainframe computer, doing backups and stuff like that at night. So I said, well, hey, look, I'll try and do that. And uh, so they sent me to IBM school, learned how to, you know, do all the backups and work the mainframe computer. And this, I mean, this is back in the day when they barely had PCs, all right? <laughs> right, right. I'm sitting here, I'm like, I can't even picture yeah, what a mainframe you can't looks like. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we had a whole room, you know, it was a big old computer. So anyway, it's just kind of piqued my interest there. Uh, but uh, graduated from LSU in uh, 89. I went to work for a KPMG, big uh, accounting firm, uh, doing audits and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, as I went through and worked and, you know, did audits for these different big companies, I was really interested in all the processes they had. And it was always an interest of mine to figure out how can I do it? They're doing things manually. They're doing it with paper. They're, right. they're carrying things around in file folders. They're using FedEx a lot. I always wondered, how can I do that with a computer somehow? You know, so uh, eventually got a job. I, I worked various jobs in uh, uh, different companies, community coffee, a big law firm. Uh, but I ended up at uh, KG Constructors uh, back in 1998. And that was right when all the big Y2K stuff was coming. And uh, got started there as their controller. Uh, we put in a new accounting system so we didn't lose everything when Y2K hit. Right, right, right. And, uh, of course, nothing happened. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, we're on a uh, you know brand-new computer system. Uh, we had just landed a gigantic job. It was like a big $60 million job. And uh, um, I had a small accounting department. And we started out, we, um, 
we had a problem. We we doubled the size of our crews. We went from about 1,500 uh, guys out in the field to 3,000. And we had to find a way to capture all their time uh, wow. with two payroll clerks who were manually keying all this stuff in. So uh, I ended up hiring a uh, local computer company to come in and help me uh, figure out how to program a uh, software program that they could key in the time in the field. Uh, they came and did that. They were keying the time in the field. It kind of I didn't have to hire anybody else. But our uh, second problem that happened was we started paying all the bills uh, that came in from doing this huge job. And I had three accounting clerks uh, processing all this paperwork. In addition, we had uh, offices in Houston and Dallas and Lake Charles and North Carolina. So every Friday, we would take all these mountains of paper, we'd stuff them in uh, FedEx boxes and send them out and hopefully get them back so we could actually pay the bills. Well, things get lost along the way. So uh, at that point in time, I had the slow programmer guy who did my timesheet program. I said, man, we got to find a better way to do this electronically. So uh, he said, uh, I said, well, let's go figure out if we can uh, uh, take a scanner uh, have them scan in the paperwork and somehow get electronically and route it around. Long story short, we developed the uh, system we eventually went to go sell. Um, and for about three or four years at Cajun, we used it there as kind of a, you know, guinea pig uh, spot there. If and they can make it work, anybody can make yeah, it work. Yeah, we, we kind of, we tweaked it and we showed other people outside, friends of ours, of what we were doing. And, you know, it got pretty good. And then uh, you talked about taking the leap. So uh, it was back in uh, 2005, I think it was during the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, I had the week off and I was sitting there, I'd kind of done everything I could ever think of to do an accounting. To be honest with you, I was bored with it, didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and- uh, Bored with accounting? In accounting. I mean, I, I still, you know, I, I'm still one of those guys who wants to get, get, get it down to the penny. Yeah. But uh, it's kind of ingrained in you, but uh, just wanted something different. So. Um, I called up the, uh, that programmer who had uh, um, started it all with me. His name's Paul Rice. And I said, Paul, I said, we kind of talked about it for a while of going and starting this business. I said, I'm ready to do it. So uh, he quit his job. I turned in my notice there. Uh, well, luckily, well, I say turned in my notice. Uh, Lane Grigsby owns Cajun Constructors. He's a big, you know, um, um, what do you call it? can't even come to mind. He, he's really big on entrepreneurs. Okay. Okay. Pro proponent, proponent of, of entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I went to him and I said, Lane, we kind of talked about maybe, you know, going out and selling us on the road. And he said, well, let's do it. So uh, he's the guy that really got me started there. And uh, Paul and I got together and started the business paperless environments back in 2005 and uh, been going ever since for 16 years. Yeah. Cause I, ha I mean, having that, that shift from like CFO to being, you know, CFO of a company that you've been working for to now being CFO or CEO of your own company. Yeah. It's may look one and the same, but really it's not. It's Because you're not, not just CFO. It's, it's not. No, it, it really isn't. I, I'll be honest with you. It's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I mean, you go from, really you go from working for a company where you really don't have to if everything's going fine, you don't have to worry about anything. Your yeah. paycheck's going to come on Friday. It's exactly. And you can go home on the weekends and do your thing. To yeah. now it's like, you know, am I going to make payroll on Friday? I'm worried about my employees. Just everything. It's all on your shoulders. So yeah. it, it, it goes from being, oh, it's not on my shoulders. You know, they're going to make payroll. Doesn't matter. Correct. Like, it's, not, it's not on me. If, right. they, if they don't, you know, I'm going to come after them because I need my payroll. Yeah, exactly. And it's no like, big deal. You're, you're, you're like the buck stops here. You know? Exactly. Exactly. So it, it, it was hard, I tell you, but I uh, had some really good people. In fact, uh, some of them are in the house here today. They're still with me. Oh, wow. So I've got I've got employees that have been with me 15 or 16 years since we started. Well, I mean, your son was you, your son kind of has to go with you. So he, I don't know look, if he really counts. I have a picture. Uh, I think probably about three or four months after we started, I had promised them we were going to go to Disney World. And uh, along the way, I decided to start the business. And they're like, well, you know, we're going to Disney World. So, nope, we're still going. I have a picture of me. We're in the airport uh, trying to get on a plane. I'm, I can remember I was on the phone. It was a picture of me talking about a payroll problem. And he's about two feet tall standing next to me grabbing onto my leg. So, mm -hmm. so 24 years later, he's now one of my head uh, sales guys, uh, has been for the past two years. So it's been a long, exciting road. But it's, it's amazing how it comes around. Yeah, it's exciting to see something, you know, 
a company that you build as an entrepreneur to turn into a family matter, right? Yeah, yeah. To turn into something that is, you want to have your family come work for you. Well, and it, it builds it, that relationship. It has to. Or it, it could to. hurt it. Yeah. I mean, depending on the day. And uh, my wife's listening in right now, too, but I uh, can't do it without her. I mean, if you don't have something, someone backing you, because, I mean, there, there's some hard times along the way, Yeah, you know, to, to make it through. And you've got to have that backing of the people who work for you and your uh, your family at home. So anytime I meet an entrepreneur who's actually running a business, hats off to them, because I know what they're go- that what they went through. But yeah. Luckily for us, we uh, we made it through, made it through some hard times. You learn, you you adapt, you adjust, uh, just like many people have over this past year. And uh, the guys who can do that can move on and be successful. Right. And not every one of them can. No, no, you, you can't. You know, yeah. it, it, the biggest overnight success is 10 years in the making, right? Exactly. And exactly. It doesn't just happen like that. You know, Paperless didn't grow from you and your one person to yeah. the team you have today. And it took us about eight to 10 years. And then, yeah. you know, things happen in business and you go into that next level. So, yeah. And recognizing when it's that time to take that next leap of faith. Yep. Yeah. You know? Sometimes it's luck, but a lot of times it's hard work. So, oh, yeah. It's thousand percent is hard work. You know, mm-hmm. like you said, on the family vacation, taking calls oh god yeah. when, when you're in That's those constant. early those early phases you got to do stuff like that right exactly it, it's know? constant it's 24 hours a day yeah because if you want to have that better life for your family if you want to have that company your son can come work mm-hmm. at for you you've got to do what it takes to yep. make it happen yep yeah, absolutely so in the in the paperless scheme you've got uh scott Godin on the facebook page asked what can you do about banks wanting to go paperless what can we do about banks? I'll be honest with you, most of the big firms out there, the big document management firms started out in the financial industry. So be honest with you, banks have kind of been paperless for a long time, even though you sit there, you know, doing all the loan paperwork and you sign in your name about 50,000 right. times. Well, so, so like, how can we eliminate that? Uh, really, it comes down, I think, to uh, then they're slowly getting there and they're, they're kind of getting there. It all comes down to whether you have to have original signatures or you can actually use the electronic signatures. So digital signatures now are becoming more and more prevalent and they're being accepted by the courts. And uh, that was really the big holdup. It was really the attorneys and the courts that wanted that blue ink on everything. And yeah, it, it, it caused ink. everybody to go, look, I have to have the paper. I can't do it electronically. So um, I think everything's coming around now to where it's being accepted. There are ways to track it electronically so you can prove who signed it and, you know, and check all of that. So it's, it's getting there. Yeah, because that's, I mean, I guess for cr- digital sig- signatures, you want to know who actually signed it. Exactly. Not just that computer or that IP address. Yeah, exactly. I mean, is it something that could be done with like a webcam and actually filming the person typing it out? I'm sure you could do that, but I mean, it it comes down. Or like a thumbprint being required, something like that. A lot of them do that. They'll do the thumbprints, but uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to, you have to have that personal aspect of the actual, uh, the bank person actually checking your credentials and all that. But you're, you're, you're tracking, you know, GPS coordinates and, uh, uh, the IP address of where you signed it and all of that. So, right. Were you in this area on this date? Correct. Is it reasonable that you could have signed this document? Yeah. Yeah. So you've been in business for 16 years. What was that kind of first leap like, you know, going from this comfortable job, like we said, you didn't have to worry about payroll to now it's you and one of the person. What were those early days like that you can remember? It was actually uh, four of us. Uh, there was me, Paul, uh, one other programmer, and my sales guy. And uh, wow. every day it was just, man, you know, uh, okay, you kind of go along. We start out with a great line of credit. You know, you kind of trucking along. Don't have to worry about too much. So, but, wait, so how did you get a line of credit as a startup? Uh, it has to do with uh, the owner, like I said, at uh, Cage's <laughs> Construction, Lane Griggs. He's a great man. So Okay, so he was he acted as a, uh, a line of credit he was a, investor? He was a guarantor, yeah. Okay. He, he guaranteed our line of credit for the first year, and uh, that kind of got us going. And uh, But, you know, you go along. It's, it's all about finding customers, get your name out there. And um, I belonged to a couple associations at the time. It was Construction Financial Managers Association. And we would go and talk to the people we knew. You get your friends down the road first to come. And right. they'll take a risk uh, with you and buy the product. And that, that gives you a month worth of payroll. And you go find <laughs> the next guy. And you know, it's, it's that's how the, you roll it. It's that landing strip. How yeah. long is my landing strip it's all before about this the plane strip. crashes yeah. and burns? Well, I tell you what. Uh, we started the year Katrina hit. 
So we were going yeah. along. We're going along. We're marketing all within Baton Rouge, New Orleans, the Gulf South, and we're kind of getting a little foothold. And you know, we got a little customer here and another one there. Then Katrina hits. Then Rita hits. So it took. You know, <laughs> Katrina takes out the the right side of the the equation of what we were marketing in. And then Rita comes and hits Houston in that area. Took all of that out. And um, but that was really that was a launching point for us because we were just thinking local. Like I said, friends and family, people we knew. But when all of them went out and have all that problems, we had to look outside. So we ended yeah. up luckily getting in with a, uh, a local conference. I think it was in Dallas. And um, a sales guy got on there as a sponsor. We went there and he actually sold two or three deals there. And that really kept that, it lengthened that landing strip. And uh, it made us start thinking, you know what? Hey, we can do this outside. So we started looking nationally versus local. And that's right. what really made us take off. Yeah, having that that, for, that foresight to say, okay, I want to go past yeah. friends and family. And it's, it's hard. It's I mean, nerve wracking. Right most people that I talk to, they're thinking of everybody that they know because you're comfortable, you know the area, you're not afraid to walk in there. But you start getting out of there and tell everybody from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you know, and you're like, <laughs> You're from where? You know where? Where is this? City? Where is this? Yeah, you guys in the South know how to do software, so uh, right. You know, but uh, that that's been a, a hurdle right there. But, uh, but usually it doesn't come up until they they're kind of surprised after. You know, they yeah. expect you to be from uh, from uh, you know um, um, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, and you know all those places Austin, like that, or, that, or Redmond, Washington, or something like that with Microsoft. You know, right. they expect you to be from there. You know, like oh, we're from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So, so how do we, on that note, how do we start to kind of change the perception that people have of Baton Rouge as a non-tech or a non-entrepreneurial city? I think it's getting the word out with things like this, with your podcast. Um, there are really a lot of local tech oriented entrepreneurs, some that you've had on your show before. And I think it's a matter of getting there and just telling the story that, hey, you know, we've we've got uh, IBM came here and put their school in. Haven't right. seen too much out of it, but, you know, they're trying to make an investment. Yeah, they're, they're um, starting. But LSU's got a great uh, computer science school. Southeastern has a wonderful school and we're getting good developers out there. It's a matter of just trying to keep them here. Right. Right now, um, you know, we've got a good handful of really big shops here that not many people know, but they gobble up everything that we have. So it'd be great, you know, if we got the word out and we start attracting those people to come here and not leave and go to Houston and Dallas and California and everywhere else. Yeah, you know? I mean, that's the, the, the conversation that, that has happened way too many times is people can't wait to leave Baton Rouge. They can't, right. wait, can't wait to get out of the little big town that we are, mm -hmm. you know, and go out to the, the tech hubs or yeah. the tech, the places that tech can really take off, you right. know, the, where the Facebooks come out. Exactly. And, you know, it's like, why can't, you do that here when we see all this success that's here already. I think it's a slow progress because uh, you've got to actually have the companies that will actually invest here and make it bigger. And we're trying to do that here. I mean, right. we, we start out with four. We, we've got 33 people now um, and we're, we're trying to grow it locally and, you know, keep it here. And just in Baton Rouge, you got 33? Just in Baton Rouge, yeah. <clears throat> okay. And um you know, it's going to take that kind of investment and it's going to take time for people to realize that they can stay here uh, and enjoy our lifestyle and go to LSU football games and all that, but also have that that high tech uh, career, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's we definitely need it because we need the re we need the resources of, you know, tech people to come and work for us. So <laughs> Yeah. And with with the ever evolving and ever rapidly changing workspace, I mean, Whenever I'm sure, whenever you started in accounting, it was not the same as accounting is today. No, no, yeah, a lot different. I mean, we that's another thing that kind of got me started with KPMG. We actually carried around uh IMAX uh to all of our our uh, our jobs, so it was the first uh, I think the first public accounting firm to actually bring a computer with them. Wow, uh, nowadays, all they they do everything on their laptops, it's all you know, um, electronic audit papers, it's a totally different world. Yeah, it's, I mean, I know just within my own space, like I was talking with um, some people who had taken the exam beforehand, like not even that long before me, like maybe five or six years. Mm -hmm. And we were going through the uh, the BEC section mm -hmm. and they were talking about, oh, we didn't have any IT questions. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I had so many information technology questions that 
it's like, do, why do accountants need to know this? You know, uh, yeah. Why do accountants need to know about database security? Why mm-hmm. do we need to know about, you know, transmitting paperless documents and sending emails and how are they coded? How are they, you know, secured? Well, look like, at it, the look landscape's at, changed. Look at Enron and all those guys. I mean, they did it all electronically. So, yeah, you, you got to watch all that kind of stuff. I know. And then you've got the, the rules and regulations start adapting to this technological advance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when companies like you come in it's like okay great now we can move away from the paper yeah how do we shift that mindset from people like yourself even i like the old school tangible feel how can we work past that yeah to get to even more digital eco space and really a lot of it comes down to security also i mean we're going through uh, uh we've hired some consultants out of lsu to help us you know beef up our security with all of our uh, documents that we keep for our clients out in the cloud and stuff like that. Cause everybody's worried about, you know, people finding out uh, trade secrets and, you know, get into their paperwork and hacking into stuff. So that's a big part of it too. But, you know, there, there are ways now to actually make that safe as if it was in that filing cabinet cabinets in your back room. So people are getting more and more comfortable and now they're pushing us to make sure that we have everything out in the cloud and it's accept, uh, yes. accessible, you know, remotely, especially after we went through this this past year. Oh, you know, yeah. Everybody working from home, they, you know, you can't go down the hall and pull it out of the <clears throat> filing cabinet anymore. I got to have it, you know, online. So Right. And so w- within that, that COVID conversation, what did y'all see from y'all's business standpoint happen? You know, did y'all slow down? Did y'all speed up? What, what was we y'all's actually, space looking like? We actually like? sped up. I mean, um, for us as a, as a company, I think we handled it very well. We, about two weeks before they actually mandated everybody, you know, got to go, not go to work. We actually were working from our homes and um, that worked very well. We were prepared for it. Uh, but our clients, you know, it was a big boost for us because all of their guys start work from home. So, of course, they need more licenses and I need this module and that module. And we need to be able to access this from the cloud and this from over here from our, you know, from our homes. And uh, it really helped us. We had a record year last year. It was awesome. Wow. That's that, that's that's nice to see because y'all have already experienced, you know, adversity when it came to, when it comes to business. You started yeah. around Katrina, mm-hmm. right? You know, you yeah. started around natural disaster. And so we don't want to do that happened, again. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, mm-hmm. starting then, do you feel like y'all were more prepared this time around for something that was out of the blue? No one could see it coming nor the impact. I think so. But I think it also comes down to planning. Um, you know, we, we were going through as a business just to make sure for our continuity that we had everything in place just in case something happened. We weren't thinking of COVID, but we were thinking of that next, you know, Katrina that might hit or, you know, we, we lose everybody loses power at their uh, at their office all the time or loses the Internet. Right. You know, we wanted to make sure we were, were prepared to do that. So we did exercises where we could make sure that everybody could get to it from their house and access everything that they want and it, timing was perfect we had already been through it we had it in place and it was like all right guys i made the call i said look I, I this sounds like this covid stuff's getting bad i said we're gonna we're gonna try and st- keep everyone safe start working from home tomorrow and yeah. we just went home and did it so. and so what is your kind of client onboarding process look like like if a new client calls in what does that look like for them so basically, they'll call in if they're interested. We'll give them a, a run through and a demo, you know, live with one of my sales guys. Um, once we make the sale, uh, we turn it over to our customer success team. And basically what they do is they start having meetings with them uh, to map out exactly how the training is going to happen. And uh, they put it on the schedule. And we've got some great trainers Um you know, my my head trainer is actually an ex uh, uh, client of mine who uh, implemented in her office for about 10 years. And then she oh, came wow. to work for us. She's unbelievable. She actually works out of uh, Fort Worth. So she's working remotely. And um, we get them. Uh, we do just about everything online now. Back in the day when I started, I actually Paul did all the uh, programming. I did all the training. I would actually fly there for a week. I was on site for a week. Now it's. You know, we'll do we'll do five or six different trainings a day with our clients across the United States uh, with Zoom or something like that. And uh, we walk them all the way through. We'll take it through the various departments that are using the software uh, for the different levels of people. It might be the accountants doing one thing and might be the guys out in the field doing another. But we'll walk them through the process according to the plan. And once they decide they sign off that everything's good, then they get turned over to our customer support department. 
Good deal. So, and it's like for, for an accounting firm, for example, how would they use like a paperless product? Uh, or what would that look like for them? I don't have, I, to be honest with you, we don't have any accounting firms. Our specialty is because uh, we got started in construction. Okay. Uh, so, use, a construction company, what does that look like? Construction companies. Uh, <clears throat> um, we'll. I take that back. We'll actually start out in the accounting department at some right. of these businesses. It's the heart and soul of the company, right? It is. It really is the heart and soul right there. It's, uh, you know, the back end keeps them running. The guys are out in the field doing the work, but you got to have that back end there. So I got to give my plug for the accountants. Uh, but we, we typically get started in the, the areas that have the most paper. Accounts payable is probably the biggest. Second is probably HR. So, um, um, that's what really what we're known for when we began. We have our own accounts payable routing system. So you can imagine they're bringing in purchase orders to buy stuff. Then they're getting all the receiving tickets for everything that they bought. They got to match them up to the invoices that come in. We do that electronically. They can scan it all in. We give them a mechanism to where they can match all that stuff up and uh, send it around to all the approvers. They have to approve for payment okay. uh, electronically. Um, so that's, that's probably the, our bread and butter. That's where we get most of our people in the beginning. And we're taking care of that big paperwork nightmare. We try and grow it from there. So we'll go to the HR departments and, you know, they've got all the paperwork for all the employees and everything that you need to get from out in the field for vacation request forms and leave time and payroll and all that. And we'll, we'll route those things in. And then, uh, from there, we're building different tools for uh, other departments. Um, our latest one, we came up for the safety departments in, in construction companies. Um, so all those JSAs. Yes, exactly. Well, actually, we're, we're doing what they, uh, a lot of them do what they call lockout tag out. Mm -hmm. um, if they're uh, working on a piece of machinery or a big electronic circuit, they've got all this paperwork they have to sign off on and what's the plan for what they're going to do. Everybody's got to sign off. What's your, they gotta sign what's off. your scope yeah. of, the, of work? All of that. And they've got to actually put locks and assign locks and everybody's got to take their locks off. You got to record all of that. When did it get put on? When did it get put off? Who signed off on it? And, uh, uh, my, we had a safety consultant came and said, look, man, he goes, look at all this paperwork that we're doing. Is there any way we can do this electronically? So we took a look at it. I mean, they were taking hours to do some of these big lockout tag outs. So we came up with a phone app, you know, where they can oh, actually wow. do, they can do it all on their phone. They can set it up. The guys can log in. They can put in their, uh, their locks. We're recording in the background, you know, when it got put on, when it got taken off, they, we can capture signatures and all that. But in the end, when they close it out, they never touch a piece of paper, but we produce all that paperwork and all that data and we, we uh, save it in the background. So that's, right. a, that's the latest thing we've come out. And uh, so it really got us kind of focused now, the accounts payable part and the document routing and all that, it's kind of our base model for everything that we do. And any company has that problem and can use those. But sometimes it gets kind of old school. You know, they're like, they don't want to see it. What's, what's your latest and greatest? What's the flashy stuff? And right. we're trying to find different things like a lockout tag out system or an electronic form system or something like that. Um, that kind of gets us in the door, solves another big paperwork uh, nightmare for them and, uh, you know, can lead to all of our other products that we manage everything for. Right. Because like so my, so my family owns a, an industrial plumbing company. Mm -hmm. And so they have to go through a lot of the lockout tag outs. They have to go through a lot of the permits, the JSAs. Yep. And all of that is all done in three part paper. Right? Exactly. Your white copy, your pink copy, and your yellow copy. Yep. You know, and you have to go through and fill out all that, sign it all, how many people are on the job, right. what's the PPE, you gotta mm -hmm. check the boxes. And yep. yeah, it ends up with just mass amounts of storage that is required. Well, it's not just that, it's you've gotta get it from the field, it's gotta come back to the office, it's probably sitting on somebody's desk. Or in a pickup truck. And a and pickup they just, truck. They just leave it. Yeah, it gets lost on the on the dashboard of the pickup truck or it got right. washed in their jeans or something like that. You know, <laughs> the jean washing. Exactly. I mean, we try and eliminate all that. Everybody's got a smartphone now. A lot of people have, have tablets. They've gotten cheap enough now. They'll carry those around. Just do it electronically. You know, put your signature on with your finger and hit go and go go do your job. Don't worry about all that paperwork. It yeah. It's taken care of in the background. And which is incredible because what I've noticed over the years is the affordability of technology for, oh, yes. mom, for mom and pop shops. Yeah. You know, for those that were, it's unheard of for us to get a digital system. It's unheard right. of for us to get a database or anything like that. When we've got, you know, everything in a filing cabinet behind the doors, mm -hmm. why do we need to switch to something on our phones or on the tablet? But- Whenever you sit down and have that conversation, like, and the sales team goes in, you have those do those fit those dollar figures conversations. If it yeah. comes out 
well, this is actually very affordable for what we need and would greatly improve the operations. Absolutely. I mean, if you get that re- return on your investment, if they really sit down and think about how much money and time it takes for them to do all this paperwork and, and the risk involved on the back end, if they don't have some of this, if you get audited by OSHA or something like that and you don't have these documents, I mean, you can have some huge fines. But beyond that, I mean, it's become really affordable. I mean, tablets nowadays, you could get a Chromebook for like a hundred bucks. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not a big deal. Yeah. But the bigger thing, it's really generational. Uh, you know, when we first started, it was the, the I don't want to say the older folks, but it was <laughs> the, the, guy, the, the better aged. <laughs> it was the better aged guys who were out there that, you know, why do I need this stuff? You know, I can't build a building with piece with a piece of electronic right? electronics, but I can do it with my hammer. You know, why do I need that? Now we've got the younger folks coming in. They're learning it in college. They're learning in high school. Growing up with it, they expect it. So really for us, it's just now coming to fruition where, you know, it's a whole lot easier to sell now. Uh, We'll go and do presentations to their group and they're all looking at the old guys going, no, we've got to have this. That's why, you know, I I, I have to have this if I'm going to work here, you know. Which then comes to the conversation that it's a little more tricky in the workplace, the Mm -hmm. generational conversation. Yeah. Right. Because typically your your C-level suites Mm -hmm. in a typical scenario, they're they're well, they're better aged. Yeah. Right. And they're not within that same demographic they're trying to hire, mm, right? So then right. you start having this difficult conversation of maybe they feel less intelligent mm-hmm. because of, oh, well, if they know how to work this, like that, that you're, you're trying to put me out of business or something. Right. Like exactly. that's always the go-to. Well, you're trying to get rid of my job. Right. right. Exactly. So how do you have that delicate conversation with people and let them know that we're trying to help you with this and it's not that challenging to learn? We, I, I mean, it's getting easier. I mean, typically, I mean, your guys running businesses, they're not, they're not stupid. Right. Okay. Right, I right, mean, right. you got the really old guys that have just been doing it out of the back of their pickup truck forever. You know, you're not going to convince them that they need that because they haven't had it forever. But I mean, your typical business owner now, I mean, you read about it, you see it, you know what's coming. You're trying to hire. People are asking you questions about Tell me how you do this in your in your business. Why do I want to come work for you? So it, it's it's not too hard on that end. Uh, it's it's more our job to show them that if you don't do this, you know, here are the risks. Here's what you're actually spending. Right. Here, you know, here are all the pitfalls for not having it, and it, it's it's an easy sell. You know? Yeah. It's so. look. This is what you're doing. This is where some shortfalls are happening. Some miscommunications. Right. And here's how to use it, right? And plus, especially on the, the construction side, I mean, their profit margins are so small. They're so competitive. I mean, it's like, look, if you're not doing it, I guarantee you your competitor is. Yeah. You don't want to be there. You, know? you don't so, want to be behind your competitor. Exactly. You know, if you can have somebody come in, like, for example, we had somebody come in for a home renovation. Mm-hmm. And we've had several different contractors come in. Some will sit there and draw it out with their level and their ruler and their paper. Right. And you've got other guys that are going to come in and they like a younger contractor came in and he was taking pictures. Right. He took pictures. I'm like, I'm like what are you going to do? He's already got my, la- my laser measure. I'm going to measure everything, la- everything la- laser you. wise. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm good. Yeah. I'm going to go home and draw it up in CAD and that's going to be your plans. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's using technology for the better. And the thing is the guy walks up with the hand drawn or he draws up, walks up with the CAD drawn. Which one are you going to buy? You know? Well, <laughs> not even that. It's, if he's got a question of, oh wait, how did this look? I don't remember the exact layout of right. this. Now I've got a picture to reference. Yes, exactly. You know, and putting all of that into the database for the construction company is huge. Yep. I mean, it takes home renovations from having to call the homeowner six or seven times to exactly. now being able to, if you do a walkthrough video, mm-hmm. uh, you've got everything. Exactly. Especially with our electronic forms, we're having great success with uh, a lot of some really big flooring companies that do installations. And uh, they're going on afterwards and they're doing inspections of all the work that their installers did. And they're walking through. It used to take them hours to walk through and write down everything and take a digital camera and take pictures of it. Now they're walking around with a tablet. They're answering all the questions. They're taking pictures along the way. They're doing their punch lists, all electronic. And they're, they're walking out in 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, but they have pictures and they've got the electronic data right there. And if they need to, they can have someone sign off on it. That Yes, I agree with this. So, right. It's, you know, it's. It's a different it's world. It's 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 truly incredible what even home inspectors now, they've got their software that they can go take a picture and do a little caption. Oh, what yeah. is this? You know, it's like, oh, 
uh, you know, mold in the ceiling or whatever, yep. you know, oh, too little insulation right here and like draw a box, right. white red it's at. And as a homeowner, as a home a home buyer, potential buyer, seeing that's incredible. Oh, exactly. Because I didn't yeah. go to the exact spot, whereas mm -hmm. beforehand they have to remember and yep. jot it all down. Yep. And so then it's like, how do you maintain this level of, you know, innovation when technology is where it's at already? Yeah, and it's amazing where it's going. I mean, what they're doing, what I've seen in different con conferences I've been to with drones and this uh, stuff they call BIM, where they're doing 3D modeling and everything. It, it's amazing. I mean, 10, wow. years, 10 years from now, it's going to be incredible. It, it just leaps and bounds. Yeah, and then now with people more and more, you know, worrying about how much paper they're using, mm -hmm. it all goes back to that question of, well, can we get that digitally? Yeah. You know, it still amazes me, though, is uh, we still go into companies that uh, big companies that you would expect. Oh, surely, you know, we we're probably wasting our time because they, they're probably electronic on everything. And just the amount of paper still going around, you know, they scan some things, but they still have rooms and rooms of filing cabinets. They're still doing it the old way. And these are multi-billion dollar companies. So it, it's, it's widespread. It's any company. I mean, everybody has paper. You know, yeah. and there's always a way to make it better. Yeah, absolutely. I know, like for uh, for example, for for timesheets, we were all doing everything paper, printing them out and signing them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and having to attach our our sheets behind our initial cover and sign in and bring it to the desk. And now it's like, yeah. oh, COVID kind of sped up the process for a lot of companies. I go feel. online and do and it. And so now everything yeah. <laughs> we're doing is online and saving straight to our server with a digital signature. Yep. You know, and I think COVID was one of the a role to play in people advancing their technology. Game. Absolutely, yeah, they had to. You, you've got to pivot and adjust, or you die. So, and you know, the ones lot. that do are doing well. <laughs> yeah, and it's the, the ones that are able to pivot are growing yes. now. You know, yeah. they're not just shrinking. Absolutely. Well, look at uh, look at restaurants, for example. Those poor guys. I mean, they had to do everything they could. But, you know, how many times now do you at least walk in and hit a QR code and pull it up electronically for a menu? Now so, you, get a menu. you know, they're like, why didn't we always do that? You know, and that also begs the question of those people who are accustomed to having a menu. How mm -hmm. do you also appeal to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know? provide them with the tablet. You can read it here. <laughs> and, and that's we went to a restaurant downtown and I forget which hotel it is. The great went to the Gregory mm -hmm. and that's what they do. They give you a tablet when you walk in yeah. and it's your menu. And I'm like, oh, this is, I've never seen this before. Yeah. It's cool. A tablet with the menu. I'm like, this is pretty cool. With pictures. Hey. Yeah. With pictures. I'm like, almost like that. No, they weren't that advanced. Yeah. Like that'd be great. Some to are. Be, some are. Tap on the menu item and the picture pops up right. looks, and you're like, okay, I don't want that. that They'll good. get there. They'll get there. <laughs> so we were talking beforehand and the kind of guy that got us linked up chat. Mm -hmm. um, before him, you were doing outbound or outsourced marketing. And still do. And, st and yeah. still do. Yeah. And still do. But there was a thought that ran across your mind or your team's mind mm -hmm. to bring someone in-house. Yep. What did that decision kind of look like? Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of one as we grow. So we uh, put a plug in for my marketing guys at X Design. Uh, they've been working uh, for us for years. And they're our, we call them our, mar our marketing department. They did, I would have meetings with them and they would do all of our branding, you know, logos, branding, colors, all the website, anything we need to do promotionally for trade shows and that sort of stuff. And uh, they do an excellent job. Um, we've grown so much now and we have so many products that we actually put out. It's hard to keep up and um, for, for getting that, that excitement of something new that's coming right. out. So it's hard to relay that with just me kind of telling them about, about it. So the idea came to, uh, as, side note, all the social media stuff that we need to do. It's hard to do that when someone's not in your office on a daily basis. So that was another aspect of it. So we made a decision uh, this year to bring someone in house who can actually be on staff in the meetings, you know, talking to the developers, talking to the training people, talking to the salespeople. What are they excited about? What's new? What's coming out? And make sure that we get it on social media immediately. Uh, communicate with X Design if they're doing some publications or or advertising for us. Make sure that we have that inside knowledge, right. that inside excitement and feel, <clears throat> and relaying it as a full time job because I'm busy doing everything else. So. Yeah, you, you don't have time to be thinking about oh I got to I have to email these three clips or these three photos. Right, you know, that's the biggest challenge I've seen for companies who are focused as they should on the operations. Mm -hmm. Right, bringing that revenue in yeah. is that content creation. Yeah. 
how do you go about creating the content for your company when you've got to make sure that payroll's met next week, right? And that's the problem. It becomes that fifth thing that you do and you, you kind of go around, I did one, two, three, four. Okay, let's work on this for a couple hours. You just, you, you get to the point, you can't, you can't keep up. Yeah, it, it can't get done adequately. And Correct. also if you're, you know, leading a meeting, mm -hmm. you can't also document the meeting. Exactly. You have to worry about the presentation, yeah. but that, you know, bringing in that internal hire to mm -hmm. walk around and, you know, use a camera and film some of it and put it together for a yeah. clip and then create it into a nice video or a nice, you know, carousel format for Instagram or whatever platform it may be. Right. Now you're really starting to separate yourself from the next guy. And you just mentioned all the things that I can't do. So, you know, you got to find, you got to find that talent. Right. So, right. You, you got to find the talent who knows all of that beforehand, mm -hmm. which a bulk of the, 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 I say the kids nowadays, the younger or the, the less aged yeah. people, they have always grown up with it. Like, they have, you know, yes. you get and anyone in college now knows no life without a smartphone. Exactly. They yeah. don't know what it was like prior to a smartphone or a mm -hmm. flip phone or a car phone or a briefcase phone. You they know? just they naturally can swipe and they do naturally everything. can swipe because exactly. they, yeah. they do it for themselves personally. Right. They're already on all the platforms the business needs to be mm -hmm. on. Now, do they know how to attack it from a business angle? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. You know, do they know how to use LinkedIn for more than finding a job? Right, exactly. And that's where you can start separating people from the crowd as a business owner when you're thinking about making that internal hire yeah. is you want to go out and find somebody who's making great content mm -hmm. or who's having conversations around great content because every business needs it. Exactly. And that's a good point because there's there's the consumer driven, you know, social media is it's one different. thing, but it's different. Uh, you've got to have somebody who's been in business and Chad, Chad had been in business and had lots of great global experience doing that sort of thing, but on the business end. So it was, right. it was a great hire to bring in to do yeah, that. hundred percent. And being able to find those people who know that yeah. is, is great because like before I started the show, I was very much in that, you know, content creator realm of individual mm -hmm. making it for myself, posting this, posting that right. for my own personal brand. But right. then it's like, I started getting into the business side of things. I'm like, this is way different. It's different. It's, it's different. all, yeah. it's like two different sports, you know, well, we're not even playing the same thing. People here. are if you're looking for something on football, you can look for football, but if <laughs> right. it's something for your business, it's a different mindset. And you've got to be able to present that to those business owners who are looking for things in the right manner. So. And understanding at what platform they're in their business mindset. Correct. Because True. all that changes. You yeah, know, we don't, we, don't need, on. we don't need TikTok videos, so we're okay. <laughs> oh, no, you need a TikTok. I do. You, you do. You do. Chat will get you there. It'll okay. get you to the TikTok. I'm sure you will. Because it's understanding how to use those platforms, right? right. When you see a, a TikTok or you see a, you know, uh, whatever platform may be, it's like, well, I see it as how my kids use it or as my right. friends use it. But when you look at how they're consuming and what the businesses are doing mm -hmm. on there, then it gets really interesting. I tell you what, I did buy something off of TikTok the other exactly. day. So you're right. <laughs> exactly. It works. It does. Because it's a different type of branding. It's a different right. type of marketing. It's yeah. not a push the product down your throat. You know, it's not like I'm sitting here like, Dr come drink at Earl's, come drink at Earl's, come drink at Earl's. Mm -hmm. I'm posting me now having a good time with the Earl's logo in the background. Right. Or I'm, you know, talking about Flashbang coming in and doing a great production mm -hmm. and you're seeing the result of the product. Exactly. I'm not sitting here selling the brand, boom, 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 boom. I'm just showing you the experience that I get from using them. Exactly. Which is then going to incentivize and drive those sales for whatever company it is. And that's what we're working on now. We're trying to get some of our customers to show some of their success stories by video and show how are you using our products out in the field. <laughs> Once people see that and get that, they're like, oh my God, why, why aren't we doing that? Yeah. So it's that customer testimonials are right. huge. Oh, it's, it's huge. <clears throat> it's I like agree. the, uh, it's like posting your Google reviews, right? Mm -hmm. But doing it in a video form. Right. Like video is a, is a tool and a mechanism within media that is so powerful and people, yeah. people undervalue it. <laughs> my son and I, uh, we actually did our own home movie when we, we, we were doing something with a new scanner that you no can, way. that you can actually take and like plug into your, uh, your, um, the they have outlets now in like the F-250s uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in the trucks now. So you can actually take a portable scanner and it hooks up to your hotspot and sends it back. But we just took my phone, went out to Ruzan, back out to where they were building the uh, clubhouse there and did our own, you know, real video right there with a with a smartphone. 
And my yeah. wife, my wife was appalled that we were doing this because, oh my God, this, you know, is so unprofessional. I went, no, it's awesome. People loved it. So. it they, they love that authenticity, right? Yeah. You know, and don't get me wrong. My, my iPhone 8 might not be able to produce a good video, right? Mm-hmm. But if you got an iPhone 10 and iPhone 12, yeah. the technology with oh, the smartphones amazing. is incredible. The camera's unbelievable, yeah. Like, I so I did my first two episodes on my phone of my, of my show. Mm-hmm. And it was just in voice memos. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't the flashy, great technology. It was an iPhone 8, right? Right. But having that stepped up technology, if you invest in, you know, buying a phone you're going to use outside of work, mm-hmm. you can justify it. Right. You know, buying a thousands of dollars worth of cameras that Flashbang has, mm-hmm. I can't justify that for a personal use. No, nah, you don't need that for your personal use. Yeah. But as a small business owner, if you've got an iPhone, you can film something mm-hmm. and post it. Hey. And it would look comparable. Jazz already done some amazing things with his 12 so uh yeah you know it's pretty cool it's it's good to get your feet wet and then when you want that next level oh yeah Yeah. that's when you bring in that professional stuff and that's where we're at now it's like look this was cool but all right let's step it up a notch how do we step it up and how do we get that that crisp movie-like feel exactly for our customers i have to get those flashbang guys come see me so and you know i heard they do great things they do yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so as we start to kind of wind down the show, we have a set list of questions we like to ask people. And the first one is, what are three lessons that you've learned along your way? You know, you've gone from being a measly old staff accountant to a <laughs> CFO to now a business owner. Oh, goodness. I think uh, the number one lesson is always make sure you've got uh, good people working with you. I like to say, get the right people on the bus. Uh, I think we've, uh, over the years, we've done a really good job. Uh, and I think now we finally got it. I had a, a conversation with my executive team the other day. I'm like, we've got everybody on the bus that we need. And they're all quality people. They mm-hmm. want to do the right thing for the company. And uh, that's key. Because if you don't have the right people, you're not going to be successful. Uh, secondly, and we're making a really big push for this. It's all about the customer. Right. Um, there's a book out there called going good to great. Uh, and that's been our theme for the past couple of years. We're trying to get, you know, we're a good software company. We wouldn't be here if we, if we, uh, weren't. And I mean, we've got 1650 customers across the United States and Australia. Um, that's good. Okay. But we want them to think that we're great, you know, and if you think about the great ones, it's like, you know, Chick-fil-A, they have great service and Apple, they're great. You know, we want to be one of those guys. Um, third lesson. Um, I think it's always about keeping yourself educated. Uh, I keep, uh, making sure that I'm out there, you know, furthering my education to make sure that I learn more to run the business better and grow. Um, in the beginning, it was all about just keeping that focus local and, you know, keeping it going and you, you, you stay small, but, uh, uh, join several groups. Uh, I've got my local, there's a CEO group called Vistage that I joined about seven years ago. It's been phenomenal. It's got some of the top, uh, CEOs in the area, uh, in our group. And we, we, we get together once a month and it's been amazing. So keeping that education going, keep yourself uh, in front of what's out there, especially for a tech company. Right. I mean, we got to make sure that we're out there doing the latest and greatest of everything. And it's hard. It, it really is hard. With how, with but, how fast it happens. Oh, uh, it, it's too fast. It's too yeah. fast. But, uh, you know, hiring good people who come who come in, and the younger folks who can come in and bring that new technology with them uh, really helps. So, Yeah, no, I, I agree with that 100%. You know, it's if you're – especially the tech company, if you don't know what the next best thing is, you're falling behind. Oh, you, you get left behind real quick, <laughs> yeah, real, real quick. fast. Yes. <laughs> so what is one thing you did as a kid you wish you could still do today? Oh, did as a kid, I wish I could do today. Um, so growing up till I was about 17, um, I used to shoot on a competitive shooting team. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 uh, what, what, what gun? Uh, we shot uh, 22s during the winter, and in the summertime, we, we went to uh, what's called, uh, I mean, long-range shooting. We would, right. do, we would shoot M14s. Okay. But uh, the group, it was, uh, uh, I grew up across the river in Port Allen, and the, the sheriff there had a junior deputy program. It was really for kids to, you know. Get, learn so, gun safety. Learn gun, gun safety. We mm-hmm. started gun safety and all yeah. that kind of thing, but we, we had a range. We would shoot on the weekends. But the cool part was the ones who really got into it, they would take us every summer where we go shoot the big guns. And then we went we went to the Nationals oh, wow. every year up in Ohio. And uh, I did that until I was 17. I mean, we had 
the the uh, the head coach was an ex marine who was friends with all of like the army shooting team, like all the big snipers who went to internationals. They were our coaches. <laughs> So that was a little unfair. <laughs> it, yeah, but it, it was so cool. And uh, that's the one thing growing up that I really enjoyed. Uh, it was a great group. I learned a lot from uh, the man that led us and uh, had a great group of guys. And I, I wish I could still do that. Yeah, that's so, got to be so fun. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of fun. So what do you love best about Baton Rouge? Um, I love it that it's it's a big town, but it doesn't have that big town feel yeah um you know you you go to places like dallas or houston all that it's exciting it really is they have lots of things to do um but it's always great to come back home i mean i, I grew up i went to catholic high i went to lsu i mean all of my friends are here uh it's great to go to lsu football games and you know and and be 20 minutes from the stadium, you know, and I have yeah. to drive for hours every day. And uh, the people are just good down home, down home people. So absolutely uh, love it. It's it's a great place to be. Yeah. And then for the, the the final question of the show is what can I do to help you? Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, this podcast showing the entrepreneurs that are here in town getting the word out that, yeah, you know, Baton Rouge, just, it's a good place to be. It's going to keep those young people here. They'll see that they have opportunities and we need that. I mean, you know, we're looking for people. Lots of people are looking for people. It's like, don't, don't, it, it was the same way when I went to, went, went to LSU back in the late eighties. I mean, everybody's like, I'm leaving here. I'm going to work for somebody in Dallas or I'm going to Houston or Atlanta or something like that. Uh, it's the same thing going on now, but you know what? They can stay here, raise a family, have a good place to live and, and not lose themselves in that sea of, people out there you yeah know, so they get when you do something here in baton rouge and you stay connected with the people here you can feel like you make an impact but more importantly you can see the impact exactly because it is that big little that little big town yeah you don't have to go very far to meet someone within your network right yeah you can generally find somebody that you want to talk to within three connections you can and like so you're finding this as you're doing your podcast they got some big businesses here there are some massive there, there are here. not pe not many people realize that but keep getting the word out and yeah. uh it, it'll, it'll grow we'll, we'll get there well i'll uh i'll do what i can to make that happen awesome well seth thank you so much for coming on well thank you for having me and thank you all for uh watching and listening whatever platform it is y'all are consuming whether y'all are in the in-house special crowd <laughs> or y'all are on the facebook live or y'all listening to the podcast or watching on youtube i really appreciate it i know the guests do and like seth said help us get the name of the show out there and get these businesses out there to have people come to baton rouge stay in baton rouge and instead of saying we can't wait to leave we can't wait to come here exactly that's kind of the goal what we're trying to achieve with the show and so thanks to our sponsor who makes all this happen triton stone group a women-owned family-led business has been around for generations and they aren't going anywhere if you need any stone needs or any construction needs they can definitely take care of you and with that being said seth thank you so much thank you very much Appreciate i am patty g host of the patty g show y'all have a good one thanks